And next, a new book takes a look at the roots of the First Lady's family tree. Gwen Eiffel has that story. Among the four million slaves living in the United States on the eve of the Civil War, there was a 10-year-old girl who a century and a half later would turn out to be the third great-grandmother of Michelle Obama. Even Mrs. Obama didn't know this family history until New York Times reporter Rachel Swarns unearthed her legacy in 2009. The First Lady's ancestors, both black and white, are part of a complicated heritage shared by many Americans. American Tapestry, the story of the black, white, and multiracial ancestors of Michelle Obama, takes us on that journey. Its author, Rachel Swarns, joins me now. Rachel, thanks for joining us. You Thank started you. out after having written about this story for the New York Times to find out about the genealogy of Michelle Obama, and instead you found the story of American history. That's right. It really is the sweep of the country's history through the lens of one family, this first lady's family. A family that turned out to be not necessarily, you, you traced it backward from knowing, of course, who, where it ended, but right. tracing it backward was kind of the drama. Well, the first lady has always known that she had white ancestors, but she didn't know who or when or where. And so I wanted to take the reader back into time to try and solve that mystery. Who was Melvinia? Melvinia was a slave girl valued at $475 in 1852. And she was the First Lady's great, great, great grandmother. And she ended up going from a farm in Spartanburg, South Carolina, to Georgia, where she fathered a child, a biracial child. And the question has been, who was the father of that child? And so you set out to figure that out. But how do you trace that sort of thing? It's very challenging. I mean, just telling these stories are challenging, particularly for African Americans, because Melvinia was unusual. She appeared in a will. Um, but before uh, the Civil War, people simply didn't appear. African Americans didn't appear in the census, and their marriages and births weren't chronicled in newspapers. So it's not easy. I noticed throughout the book, you, you often had to fall into uh, kind of a this may have happened construction. That must have been kind of frustrating for a reporter. It is, and the reality is that there are some things we just won't know. Was the path that, that you took, the path that they took, that this family took, was it typical? Was it, how widespread was it? She, her, her family story is very, very typical. It is the story of so many Americans. And they basically had front row seats to major moments in our history, from slavery to the Civil War, uh, reconstruction, segregation, the migration. It is a very, very American story. You, 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 there was a lot written about when this book originally came out about Michelle Obama's white ancestors, mm -hmm. or even when you first wrote the story for the That's New York right. Times. What, how unusual was that, really? I mean, we can look now at the African-American experience and see it's a rainbow as much as anything else. It is a rainbow, and many of us have those stories, and many people are finding that out through DNA testing themselves. You know, with genealogy tools available online, with a cheek swab, and off it goes in the mail, a lot of ordinary people are finding these stories out and making these kinds of connections. But it raises lots of uncomfortable questions, too, especially about how the original connection happened. It does. And I was able to find the mystery uh, white ancestors in her family tree and their descendants. And they, as you might imagine, really grappled with this. Uh, it's hard to look back and to know that your family may have owned the First Lady's family, in fact, indeed did own the First Lady's family. And worse still, that your ancestor may have, um, may have raped a member of the First Lady's family. These are not easy things to think about. And there's really no way to tell in the kind of research you did what, this, what the nature of the relationship was between Melvinia and the man who fathered her, her child. Right. There's no way to know. And Dolphus Shields. Uh, he's a key character in this. Tell me about him. So he is the First Lady's uh, great-great-grandfather. He was biracial, born a slave, and he really carried the family forward. He became a carpenter. He became a property owner. He became—he ran his own business. He founded churches. When he died, his um, obituary ran on the front page of the black newspaper in Birmingham at the time. And we think that he had a relationship, perhaps, with his white father, even if he didn't know it was his father? Well, we don't know. There are intriguing questions about that. He left Georgia for Birmingham, and around the time he was living in Birmingham, his, he had a white half-brother who also lived in Birmingham. 
and there are people who knew Dolphus who said that he talked about having a white brother. Whether that really was this half-brother, whether he knew who his father really was, we don't know. In putting this all together, knitting this all together, did you talk to current day members, descendants of this, of this tree? Yes. I talked to members black and white. Um, some of them actually got together quite recently. Uh, Tell me about that. Yeah. They, um, the town where Melvinia once lived as a slave decided to erect a monument to Melvinia after the story that appeared in the front page of the New York Times. And they had a ceremony. Some of Melvinia's descendants were there. Mm. And at the last minute, I thought maybe some of the white descendants would like to come. And they did. Some drove from Birmingham. Um, in parts of Alabama, and wow. some came from Georgia. It was quite something to I'll see. I'll bet. I'll bet it was. Yeah, along the way, there has always been a certain amount of shame and, and secret keeping that goes with this kind of, of connection. And I want you to read a passage from the book that I asked you to, to take a look at that kind of captures, at least in reading it, it captured it for me. That reluctance to probe the past, to look back over one's shoulder, to examine the half-healed sores that festered in grandparents and great-grandparents reappears over and over again in Mrs. Obama's family tree. It has made the search for the truth that much harder, but it is also understandable. People often turn away from what is too painful to witness. They almost always want their children to see the world as a better place, to be free of their pain. In meeting with the descendants as they met each other for the first time recently, um, th did it seem as if they had transcended that pain? I think they were willing to grapple with it. And I, I think in many ways um, they would have wished that this connection might have originated in a different way. But they accepted it and thought that they, as contemporary people, could get to know each other and exchange phone numbers, take a picture, have a dinner. And do you know if other African Americans and, 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 and whites who have grown together and grown apart in our society have also found their way back to each other in this way? Oh, many, many people are doing this all the time. And when you do these DNA tests, they connect you to your distant cousins. And for many African Americans, they find they are black, white, and in between. Fascinating. Rachel Swarns, author of American Tapestry. Thank you so much. Thank you.